I'm not sure where I left off from the other day, but so much has happened that it's kind of hard to keep track. He's in the hospital, and he's not coming home for a while. I don't know how long a while is, but for, for at least a while, we'll say that. Something was really interesting about today when I was walking through the hospital heading over to Elevator B. That's where I have to go, Elevator B. Uh, um, I started to get this, this feeling or this like deja vu feeling of all the hospitals that I had ever been in with him and all the corridors that I had walked through. And I was walking to Elevator B and I looked to the left and I saw this, this like um, window area and it just reminded me of two of the hospitals. One of the hospitals was in, um, I think it was Huntington Beach and the other was Cedar Sinai in LA. But then there was just so many other hospitals. There were so many miles that had been walked, so many pairs of shoes. And then later in the day today, I made this joke about these pants I'm wearing because the pants have got um, suspenders. And I was talking to my sister-in-law. I was like, yeah, these are my hospital pants. I said, the great thing about these is that I can just hang them on a hook and just jump into him like a fireman when I gotta go over to the hospital to visit with him. So, and we all chuckled and laughed and laughed and laughed. Um, he's not laughing right now. He's not really doing much of anything. He's kind of just laying in bed, asking for pills and trying to stay calm. And I understand that as well. The room is small and the guy that's next to him, he keeps pooping and he smells. So I'm looking forward to him going into the nursing, um, the rehabilitation center, which is a nursing home, but it's a rehabilitation center. Um, and I, you know, it was kind of interesting because in the past he's always wanted his own room, but now he's at a different phase and he's always so lonely. And I said, do you want your own room now? I said, or do you want to share a room with someone so at least you have some sounds? I said, those rooms are pretty big and they're pretty vacant. And how do I know this? Because when they called me today to tell me that they were discharging him, they gave me the name of three, of four different places. And I said to the lady, I know you can't give me your opinion on any of them, but maybe you could tell me which one you would put your mom into. And she said, none of those. I said, oh, all right. Well, of the four, which would you give me, which would you put your mom into? And so she, selected one and I said great I said that's the one that's about two miles from where we live and as I was leaving to go to visit with him I stopped by this place and I just you know I said I'd like a tour and I'd like to speak to the administrator and I'd like to check it out and so I did and it was clean and not noisy and not stinky and the you know like the floorboards were clean and the, I love the OT room because in the OT room they had an actual bed and an actual tub because, you know, he is, he's doing good with PT because he has a lot of um, external activities that he takes, you know, partakes in, but he cannot do simple things like fluff his pillows or, you know, he doesn't like to shower because it's just too draining on him. So that was an interesting area, um, but the rooms are big and it's gonna take a little bit of time to make it comfortable so that he doesn't feel like he's in just this vacant room. Anyway, so then I, um, I left and I went to the hospital where I sat with him for about three hours. You know, it kind of like, there's things that annoy me in general, like, his family um you know i'm not going to be specific about who or what but like i try to stagger the visits so one person goes at one time and then i'll show up for the next visit and then the next person will be there for the last visit and the one person didn't show up and didn't tell anybody she wasn't showing up and then you know there was the possibility of rain rain there was possibility of rain the god forbidden rain so she didn't show up so then, um, you know, I was like, that's okay. I'm on my way. I will be with you very soon. And then another family member shows up, and I'm like, yeah, I don't need you here now. I would like you to leave. But 
you know, I knew that that person wasn't going to come back later either. So I just stayed there until change of shift and, you know, just stayed with him. Um, upon arriving there, they were so proud. They were so proud of the pee device, the urine device that goes over the penis. You see how this works? And I was like, you know what? Yeah, I see how it works. I see he's soaking wet. He is soaking wet. So it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. So let's change him immediately. I, and I said to him, I said, how long have you been laying like this? I said, you're drenched. And he's like, a long time. And the girl just, you know, she just denied it or shook her head or, you know, they don't care. Where is the care in health care? Where is the care in health care? And I think that's really like my big issue right now is that I see him declining and I don't understand why people aren't stepping up. Why aren't I getting the referrals done? Why isn't the neurologist pushing forward to get the surgery done so he gets this new device? Why don't I have the wheelchair and the hospital bed and, and more security bars? Why do I have to pay for this stuff when it's part of his insurance and I just need I just need it to arrive and I don't understand. I don't understand. And you know, where did this all come from so fast? He fell. He fell three times in one week. And the next thing I know, uh, he's got a broken nose and he's got black eyes and he's just falling apart. And we're fighting, and we know don't fight like this. And he's calling me names, and the next thing you know, I'm sitting on the floor, Indian style, exhausted, not wanting to help him. And he needs me, and I just don't have the energy. And that is why I called 911. I called 911 because I am out of energy, and I am so lost in this process. This process is killing me, and it's killing him, and I'm watching him decline. This man that was so full of energy, and he's a rebel, and he's crazy, and he's not anymore, and his fire is being extinguished. So the, the ambulance shows up. No, before the ambulance shows up, I'm sitting in my car, and I said, if you are going to dial 911, what are you going to say? What are you going to say to them? And so I planned it out so that when that fire engine showed up and they, I stepped out and they know who we are. And I was like, hey, guys. And they're like, what's wrong today? Because we were just here at 3 a.m. I was like, I know. I know. And I just looked at them and I said, I don't know what to do anymore. I need help. And they looked at me and they said, well, that's an easy one. We're going to help you. And they took him. You see, this is stuff that I'm learning right now. There's a code. There is a code for wives that are crumbling. There is a code for people that need to have their husbands taken away or their wives taken away or their spouses or their, their partners or whatever taken to the hospital and it's called failure to thrive. And when the person arrives at the hospital with the coding of failure to thrive, they, the hospital staff knows that the person at home is melting, is melting down. And that's kind of interesting. And then once the person is checked into the ER, they're given another code, um, inability to socialize. And that means the wife is having a hard time. Because this is not uncommon. When the neurologist came up to the hospital room, um, this is kind of funny, um, the neurologist had just seen my husband's brother, and then my husband's brother sent him to, you know, back to the hospital. And he spoke to me and he said, you're doing this 12 years by yourself? And I said, I am. He goes, most people only make it five to seven. He goes, it's time you got some help. And I said, yeah, I know, I, I know. I need a hospital bed and I need 
stuff. I need stuff and I need people and it's not enough to have my caretaker for 32 or 35 hours a day, a, a week. It's not enough because let's say I work a 32 hour week and she covers that. I still have to come home, cook dinner, do the meds, get him prepared for bed, get him showered, walk the dog, take the garbage out, clean up. There's no, there's no stopping this. There's no stopping. And so, so then maybe I don't work. Then how do I pay the bills? You know, I mean, my overhead is so low, but that doesn't mean that we don't have expenses. You know, I was, it's kind of interesting because this week, you know, the past few days he's been in the hospital and I have not thrown the garbage out once. When he's home, I'm throwing the garbage out. That's two of the large, you know, not kitchen, two kitchen sized garbage bags get thrown out every night. Um, you know, I have not thrown out a garbage bag since he hasn't been here. Um, you know, full meals. I have been living off of apples and chicken nuggets. You know, I'm not saying that that's the best meal, but I'm just not hungry. I'm not hungry, and there's no reason to eat so much food. I do that for him. So it's like my expenses get cut down significantly when he's, you know, in the hospital. Not the point, not the point of this whole thing. Um, that's just like sharing like the difference between the expenses and working and trying to survive. So anyway, I kind of lose, you know, I kind of lose my thought when I'm thinking about this stuff. Anyway, so now he's going to go to a nursing home because once he goes to the, you know, it's like a short-term stay in a long-term place. And once he goes there, he will learn how to do the simple things that keep me up all night long, like move his pillows and adjust his blankets um, so that I can get, you know, a full night's sleep. And while he's there, I will be assigned a, a social worker so that I can get the tools in this house, prepare this house for when he comes home. And he, then he, you know, maybe it'll just be a little bit more comfortable for him. Maybe it'll be a little bit more comfortable for me. You know, I mean, I don't know that he, you know, I have a bed that, like, we call it the clam. Um, you know, it bends and, it, you know, he, I call it the clam because, like, sometimes he'll bend it so much that it's almost like eating him. It's like a clam. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's like just, you know, like it's a bendy bed. It's the, the bed bends. You know, but maybe he needs a different type of bendy bed. Maybe not just the head bends, but the neck, the, the feet, the not the feet or the neck. Not just the, the, the waist bends up, but maybe the knees bend forward uh, up as well so that he's kind of in a little bit more of a comfortable position and maybe in time we'll be able to change that mattress so that it's a compression ma mattress an air compression mattress so that he doesn't get any sores or you know bed sores because like I was at the hospital today and I saw like how like when you raise it up it's so much easier to get him adjusted when he you know like you're not breaking your back and these are the things that go along with my request for help. My request for help. I have noticed, we were talking about this today when I was in the hospital. I have to take a sip of drink. Hold on a second. We were talking about this today when I was at the hospital. The whole concept of sleep. Because he's been in the hospital two times, two nights so far, and I have slept. The first time, like, I was just dead. I was dead asleep. I was, like, I was just deceased. And then the second time, last night, I was dreaming. I was dreaming these crazy, vivid dreams that my calves were too big. And they had to be um, pierced so that they deflated. And then, my, you know, like, it was this whole crazy, vivid dream. And I was unconscious. I was six feet under, breathing sand. I was gone. And I had good sleep. And I woke up pretty good. I woke up in pretty good shape. You know, I woke up and I was able to pay a bill and go get some quarters so I could do laundry tomorrow and walk my dog so that she's, you know, doing her little puppy life, who she is. I'm going to spend some time home tomorrow so I could take care of her because she's just a little, a little freaked out with the silence. You know, my husband makes a lot of noise. He's 
not a quiet guy. But it's not just him. You know, he's got the TV on for Law & Order. Then he's got another TV on for meditation. And then, you know, my, my feet going back and forth and this and that. So it's, you know, it's a busy house with a lot of, like, household activities. So she's got to be a little lonely right now, especially when I go off to the hospital for, you know, for six, seven hours at a pop so that she, you know, she's by herself. So, so that's that. Anyway, he's going to be okay. I miss him. I love him. I don't want him there. But the other side of me wants him there. My, you know, I want him to have the best quality life that at least I can provide him. It's not the life he wants. I mean, he wants to be in California or New York. He wants to be on stage. He wants to be the man that he is, the man that he will forever be. I cannot provide that for him. But I can keep him safe, and I can keep him medicated and loved. So that's that. All right. I feel better now. Good night.